Alright, hello, my name is Ryan, and I'm going to be describing the Drood model for dispersion. Okay, so this model was developed by Paul Drude in 1900, and it describes the properties of metals um, when an electric field is propagating through it. Um, so if we were to look at this graph here, um, this model is meant to represent um, materials with negative permittivity, negative permeability, or simultaneously negative permittivity and permeability. Um, and so, yeah, this model is kind of meant to describe the reaction of electrons inside of metals um, when an electromagnetic wave passes through it. So to do that, Paul Drude considered um, what would happen to an electron as an electromagnetic wave, or an electric field, in this case, is passing through a metal. And so that's going to have an effect on the sea of electrons inside of that metal. And Paul Drude decided he wanted to describe that electric force, electric field force on a single electron using force uh, mass times acceleration and some drag. Um, so the equations for that are going to look something like this. So uh, mass times the second derivative of displacement which is acceleration, this is going to be our force. And we're going to add mass times the dampening factor multiplied by the first derivative of displacement. This is velocity, so this is going to be our drag. And this is all going to be equal to the force on a single electron inside of that electric field. So the electric field being E naught um, cos omega t plus some phase shift. Okay, so the first step is to convert all of these into phasor form. So we're going to get mass times the uh, second derivative of displacement in phasor form is going to be um, x naught phasor e to the j omega t over dt. And then we're going to add mass times gamma first derivative dt x naught phasor e to the j omega t. And this is going to be equal to q times e naught phasor e to the j omega t. And now we can take these derivatives. So we'll get mass times the second derivative of e to the j omega t is just negative omega squared times x naught e to the j omega t plus mass times gamma. First derivative of this is Mm, sorry, not negative, j omega multiplied by e naught phasor, these should be phasors, e to the j omega t, and this is just equal to the same thing, e naught e to the j omega t. So now these exponentials cancel because they appear on both sides, and now we want to isolate for x naught, so our displacement. So displacement times negative omega squared m plus m gamma j omega is equal to q e naught phasor. And now we just need to isolate for our displacement. We get e naught is equal to uh, 
we'll pull out a negative and uh, omega m. So we'll get negative e naught over omega m times omega minus j gamma. Okay, so now we need to consider um, a few other equations in order to get this into terms of permittivity. So the first thing we need to do is consider a single dipole moment. Um, so that is going to be equal to Q times our displacement times some direction. Um, and so if we sub in our displacement into this equation, we get that a single dipole moment is equal to negative Q squared E naught phasor omega M omega minus J gamma. Uh, and then we want to um, get the total moment, so we need to sum all of our moments together. So the total moment, P, is equal to the number of moments times that dipole moment. So then if we sub in our dipole moment into this equation, we get that negative N Q squared E naught divided by omega m omega minus j gamma. Okay, so now we can rearrange um, our total moment to be equal to epsilon naught epsilon r minus 1 times the electric field. And if we rearrange this equation so that we can isolate for epsilon r, we get 1 plus the total moment divided by epsilon naught e naught. And then we can sub in our total moment. So this is going to come down here and we're going to get that epsilon r is equal to 1 minus, because of that negative there, 1 minus uh, n q squared e naught all divided by Omega M Epsilon naught E naught times Omega minus J gamma. Cool. So now our E naughts cancel. And we can collect these terms here into a single term, Omega P squared, known as our plasma radial frequency squared. Um, and so now our epsilon r, our per relative permittivity, is in terms of omegas. So you can kind of see right now that if we rewrite this out, 1 minus omega p squared divided by omega, omega minus j gamma. Um, that our epsilon r is actually in terms of our frequency. Um, so our epsilon r is going to be frequency dependent. Um, that just means that our permittivity is going to be different depending on the frequency that our electromagnetic wave is applied. So now we need to isolate for the real part of this equation um, because we want a real part to be negative. All right, so let's write out that equation again. So epsilon r of omega is equal to 1 minus the plasma radial frequency squared divided by omega times omega plus j gamma. And so, or sorry, this should be minus. And so if we multiply by the complex conjugate of this, we can isolate for our real part. So we'll get omega plus j gamma on the top as well gamma. And uh, once we've expanded this, we'll get the following equation. Omega, epsilon r of omega is equal to 1 minus omega p squared divided by omega squared plus gamma squared. Uh, sorry, minus j times omega p gamma divided 
divided by omega times omega squared plus gamma squared. All right, so now we have a real component and an imaginary component. Um, okay, so now we can, if we, if we plug in gamma is equal to zero, we can isolate and only get a real component because if gamma is zero up here, it's going to set this entire imaginary term to zero. And so when this happens, we get epsilon r is equal to, uh, I should say, epsilon r of omega is equal to 1 minus omega p squared divided by omega squared. And so this is kind of the main equation here. So if we get a omega p that is greater than omega, then epsilon r is going to be less than zero. And that's, that's the result that we're looking for, because that's what can we, we can use to represent uh, ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic materials or um, metals at optical frequencies. Um, and if omega p is less than omega, then epsilon r is going to be greater than zero. Okay, cool. And so because there's no such thing as a magnetic charge or a magnetic dipole, we have to kind of make an assumption that if we set our mu r or our permeability um, as a function of omega equal to the same thing, but just a little bit different by saying that omega p subscript m squared over omega squared is an equation that we can use to re represent this and in this case, we'll get the same thing. Omega p subscript m is greater than omega, then our permeability is going to be less than zero. And uh, if omega p subscript m is um, less than omega, then permeability is going to be greater than zero. OK, cool. So now we have these results that we're looking for. And uh, now we are able to, if we wanted to, represent these materials in equations and in like an FDTD, because we've unlocked these regions on our permittivity and permeability. Um, so Materials in this region are going to be ferromagnetic, um, generally. Materials in this region are going to be metals at optical frequencies. And materials in this region are going to be known as uh, negative index metamaterials. Um, and these are really interesting because they don't actually exist in natural phenomena. Uh, they're so far only fabricated. Rude dispersion. Um, so right here, I've set my omega p and omega m p to be two omega, both of them, so that it will result in a negative three uh, permittivity and a negative three permeability. And then in the loop, I added these in with these equations here, adding them onto the h field component and the e field component, the average. All right, so let's see how this goes. Uh -oh. So this is the wave propagating through a region with negative three permittivity and negative three permeability. And uh, it takes a while to go to steady state um, as the dispersion kind of settles. But right away, you can kind of see that inside of this um, negative index metamaterial, we're seeing a backwards propagation of the wave. 
Um, but you can also see that the energy is still fully propagating forward. We're not seeing any kind of reflection over here. So I'll fast forward this a little bit so you can see it go to steady state. Okay, so now you can see that it's almost a perfect backwards sine wave within that. Since the source is a sine wave, we're getting an almost perfect backwards sine wave within there. Now that dispersion has gone to steady state. Cool. Alright, thanks for watching.